day before the conference was to close, I thought we really had things lined up and it was going to be a very successful meeting. And then the unexpected happened. Mm -hmm. And you always have to figure that there will be something unexpected. How do you cope with it? Well, this <coughs> session of the 800, the uh, ambassador for Libya suddenly started attacking Israel. Totally out of the blue, had nothing to do with any context whatsoever. And he went on for 20 minutes describing the terrible things that uh, Israel was doing and so forth and so on. And so I rushed over to the Israeli ambassador, who I had met earlier, and I urged him constraint. And I said, let's talk about it later, but why don't you say you'd just like to write a reply? Well, he was a seasoned diplomat, and he agreed, and he did that. And so we postponed the issue. But that evening, I was able to get together, or the next morning actually, on the final day, and I got together, and the chairman of that 800 group, which was, was an Egyptian uh, who I had uh, met before, and the Israeli ambassador, and myself. And we went off into a side room. The ambassador had asked for instructions from his government in uh, Jerusalem. He sent back a very hard line of saying you've got to attack them and uh, fight right back. And uh, we sat together for an hour or so and delayed the opening of, the, of that final 800 group that would then pass it on to the cleaner. And the ambassador told me about his instructions. And I finally realized that the timing was to my advantage. I said at this very moment, Cam David, my president and your president are meeting uh, at Camp David to try to resolve the problems between Israel and Palestine. And I said, I urge you not to do what you're instructed to do, but to make a very quick two-sentence comment as you disagreed. The chairman, the Egyptian, would pound it down as completed and we move on. And he agreed. But not very often that an Israeli ambassador would refine his instruction. But he saw the moment in history uh, that this was not the time to do what he'd been instructed to do. And so he did as I had suggested, gaveled through after two sentences. The document was approved, passed to the plenary, and unanimously passed by the whole conference. The press the next day called it a miracle of Buenos Aires. Nobody thought it would happen. So those are two stories that uh, I thought would certainly qualify for multi-party negotiations. <laughs> now let me move to, um, to some cross-cultural issues. Um, I uh, have some documents here that I'm going to circulate around in just a minute. <coughs> but, um, My good friend uh, Steve uh, participated in writing a chapter in a book in the mid-80s um, dealing with something that the State Department uh, certainly did not recognize. And I'd come to the conclusion over the years that because of cultural differences, every nation has a different interpretation of how to negotiate. Every nation is different from every other nation. Now, nobody had come up with that thought before. Uh, and so we put a little book together at the Foreign Service Institute, and Steve wrote the chapter on Japan, and then Japan's negotiating side. And we had a chapter on China, we had a chapter on the Soviets, we had a chapter on France, and uh, Mexico, and, uh, and Egypt different parts of the world. And those chapters were all written by Americans who had great experience in that particular part of the world. Uh, and this was very well received and it was printed as a U.S. government document. And I got to tell a story that's not in the book about uh, my experience with uh, the Japanese negotiating side. After I retired, uh, in 87, became a law professor. I was invited to become the first president of the Iowa Peace Institute in Grinnell, Iowa. 
for statewide reasons in the country. And I had three wonderful years there. And during that time, I put on uh, two one-day training sessions for Iowa business leaders who wanted to do business with Japan. Because 40, 50 percent of Iowa's produce is exported uh, to the world, and they are very sophisticated uh, business people and farmers there. And so we brought in some experts from California, and we had a great, uh, great time together, and very successful. Well, a week or two later, I was interviewed on a radio show in Des Moines, Iowa, uh, about what we were doing, and I talked about various other things, and I finally came around to this idea of business, helping businessmen uh, in Japan. And the, um, the man who was interviewing me was one of their old timers said, oh, come on, McDonald, I don't get this cross-cultural stuff. What are you really talking about? I said, well, Jim, you have this great product that you want to sell to Japan. So you go to Tokyo, you meet this distinguished business leader uh, for the first time, and uh, when you meet him, you say, call me Jim, I'll call you Takahashi, and you slap him on the shoulder and said, listen, I don't know where I said, Jim, you've blown it. I said, what are you talking about? I said, in one sentence, you violated three fundamental errors. He said, what do you mean? What do you mean? That's what we do in, in Iowa. I said, you're not in Iowa. You're in Tokyo. I said, it takes 10 years to get on a first name basis. Not five seconds. They don't like their physical space violated with a slap on the back. <laughs> and they're certainly not ready to say to business, you haven't exchanged calling cards. <laughs> he said, oh, okay, okay, I get it. Anyway, that's my little story. Okay. But um, this was a, a very good book. And uh, I'd written another book earlier uh, for UN delegates about what makes a good negotiator. And then I did later a book about um, U.S. national negotiating science. Uh, and uh, so I have that uh, laid out very, very briefly here, which I'll share with you in a moment. In, um, in uh, November of 2005, I was teaching at the National War College. I'm a graduate of the National War College, which is the senior training arm for colonels and senior civilians. It's a 10-month program. And um, it brings them together for the first time where they're actually being able to communicate with each other. And I would be giving one lecture there, and I finally talked to the professor, and I said, you know, would it be possible for us to teach a course on conflict resolution and peace building to the colonels. Well, he thought, you know, that's an intriguing idea. This had never been done in the history of the U.S. military. Uh, he said, well, why don't you put some ideas together and we'll talk to the dean. So in February 2006, I had a meeting with the dean. The dean was a military, he was a colonel in the Marine Corps, I met him when he was in full dress uniform with ribbons down to here, about six foot seven. And I had a half hour with him. And so I made my presentation. And he said, you know, that's not a bad idea, which was great. He said, put a syllabus together and take a look at it. So we did all that and make a long story short, we had all kind of bureaucratic problems with it. We finally got a three-star general to sign off on it. In January 2007, we started a um, it's a 12-week elective. Uh, we only talk two hours every Wednesday afternoon for 12 weeks. And I have six speakers that I brought in plus myself. And we talked about various aspects of conflict resolution, trauma, reconciliation, healing, things that they really had not thought about. Uh, at the end of our first 12-week period, the full colonel of the Marine Corps came up to me. The last post was Iraq. And he said, you know, if I'd only known what you taught us in the last 12 weeks, I would have done things totally differently in Iraq. Well, that's pretty powerful when you convert a Marine colonel. The focus of the course was to show that there are other ways than the gun to solve the conflict. We just finished our fifth course, a couple of, at the end of April. Uh, 
Uh, and um, we're starting at 6 o'clock again on the floor. We do it twice a year. And we've now had about 56 colonels, one or two generals actually, from um, 24 countries. Our last course, which was, uh, was um, made up of 12 people, um, three Americans and colonels from nine other countries. And during one of the lectures that I gave, I talked about negotiating styles, and then I asked each of them to write up what their national negotiating style was, which they have done. And what I have here, which we'll go over very briefly, is uh, what makes a, a good negotiator, what is the U.S. negotiating style, and then I have what all of the 12 students said their national negotiating style were. So that's, uh, that's what I'm going to be talking about in the next few minutes, and maybe we can pass this around. This is, uh, I just thought that since you're into cross-cultural issues, this is a pretty dramatic example of, of, um, of the differences that, that each country has. And so when you're interacting internationally or with people from other nations, uh, you really have to recognize power among cultural differences, <clears throat> which um, I think gradually the State Department recognizes, and it takes them a long time to change. So let me just um, briefly uh, go down the list that you have in front of you just a minute about um, <coughs> what makes a good negotiator. <laughs> And I could spend a lot of time on these, but I won't. So. And then my, and my, and I just give you some ideas. If you take a look at that sheet about film, um, what makes a good negotiator. Now I wrote this because the uh, State Department does not have any information for U.S. delegates on the United Nations and how to make the report, believe it or not. Uh, we have 6,000 uh, delegates every year go to world conferences, 6,000. 25% of them go to their first conference every year. So the idea of long-term relationship is practically non-existent. And so they didn't know how to go to the John. So this is a book that I wrote about that, and this, this document was in that was in the book for some annotation. But you see the first uh, idea of nationality. Nationality is definitely critical in a multi-party negotiation. Because whether you know it or not, you carry all kinds of <coughs> things with you which you might not even be aware of. Uh, a lot of labeling out there. I can walk into a conference uh, and know that I'm from the United States and certainly all kinds of stereotypes come up and, criticism and so forth. So you carry that into the room with you, wherever you go. Your nationality is absolutely critical for you to understand and how you're perceived by others. So that's why I put a nationality in there as the, as the number one characteristic. <clears throat> Second is knowledge. What do I mean by knowledge? I mean mastery. I'm going to repeat the word mastery of the substance of the issue you're going to be talking about. I've seen many U.S. delegates who had this pile of documents to read and they couldn't get around to reading it in time, so they get on the plane, they're reading the plane, they have a drink, they get a little tired, they drop off. They arrive at the conference site not having read the stuff that they're supposed to know about. I can guarantee you that a sophisticated negotiator can tell within about 30 seconds how knowledgeable you are about the substance of the issue. And when you reveal in little ways that you might not even understand, they'll take advantage of that. So knowledge, absolutely essential. And I mean immersion. I don't mean just reading it on the way to the plane. That's not what I'm talking about. And the next is self-confidence. 
self-confidence. Well, what do I mean by that? That means that you have to feel comfortable in your gut, in your gut about what you're negotiating. Again, an experienced person can tell very quickly that you're really not comfortable with the issue, that you're uneasy about it. So that's what I call about self-confidence. You have to, that self-knowledge, you have to know it, and you exude your knowledge across the table. I'm serious about this. You exude your knowledge across the table. If you know what you're talking about, you have complete um, self-confidence. So in that whole issue. And then those are the key issues. Patience, of course, is something that we don't do in the United States, but everybody else does. Anger, you never, ever use anger as a negotiating tool. Now, people disagree with me on that. But I'm just telling you, based on my experience, that's an absolute no-no. You have to be in total control of yourself. Now, people tell me, oh, well, you know, I can control my anger. It doesn't work that way. You cannot control your anger. Once it gets started, you lose it intellectually. And psychologists and doctors have proven that fact. I remember a, the head of a U.S. delegation to a major conference in Vienna who uh, thought he couldn't control it. He lost it. He approached the Keenan delegation, yelling at the, at the delegation leader, his uh, Kenyan uh, delegation felt that his, he was going to be attacked. They surrounded him to protect him. It was, I wasn't there, but I heard about it from many people after. It was a terrible scene. What happened as a result of that? Nobody in the entire conference ever spoke to any member of the U.S. delegation during the rest of the meeting. That's retaliation. You never lose control. You never go down the anger path in my experience, because you cannot control what you think you can control. So we have a, a sense of humor, of course, is always important. Not to, in the UN system, you can never tell a joke, by the way. There's no joke known to man that survives translation into five other languages. <laughs> <laughs> the UN worked with six languages. The Russians, the Soviets in my time, never knew that. And so people would end up, because of the garbled translation, laughing at the Russians instead of with them. <laughs> it's a big difference. It's a big difference. Well, you can use a sense of humor, it, uh, but use it with, uh, with care. Attitude, forget all of your, uh, you know, all of the, when you, when you approach the table, you have to forget about the things that you can leave behind if you're anti this or anti that. You know, try to forget about that. Try to come to the table without preconceived negotiated uh, ideas about uh, who the people are across the table. That's hard to do sometimes, but it's important. Courage of your convictions is, of course, important, and communications is the key. So let's move on now to the U.S. Uh, we'll have time for questions in a um, U.S. negotiating side. What do I say there? Impatience. We are the most impatient people in the world. We want it done right now, on our time frame, on our time schedule, the rest of the world is agree with that. So I can tell you, this is also these first three issues on how you're perceived today by the rest of the world. We're, we're impatient. Uh, the second one is arrogance. We are the most arrogant people in the world. Um, there are one or two other countries that I can name that come close, but we take the lead. <laughs> uh, and the third one uh, is listening. You know, we don't know how to listen. We as a nation, we as a State Department, we don't know how to listen. And so I tell young diplomats and others that I talk to from time to time, I said, you've got to realize that we are perceived as the most arrogant nation, the most uh, forced listeners, uh, and the most impatient people. I said, that's not the way you want to be perceived. And you know, I can tell you this. I've told this story many, many times to non-Americans. 
no one has ever disagreed with me. I just want you to know that. No non-American has ever disagreed with my definition of how we are perceived in the world. That's not the way you want to be perceived. So you have this choice. You can learn to be less arrogant. You can learn patience. And you can learn how to listen. I challenge you with that. Those are three fundamental things that you have to have. And so the three negatives that I have up there on U.S. negotiating style are to me the three most important issues. And I have never been corrected by anybody who was not an American. The ins insular is four. I think it's only 20% of the population in this country has a passport. 20% has a passport. Hmm. If that isn't insular, I don't know what is. And we bring to the table our insularity. We don't have a vision for the rest of the world in general. I just talked to a Dutchman the other day. And I said I congratulated him. I said, do you know the reason your country has the highest contribution on an individual basis to international aid in any other country in the world. He said, well, no, I don't. I know that that's the case, but why is that? I said, because in kindergarten, and in every grade up there, they talk about the world. And so when you get out as a voting citizen, you have a global image of the world. And that's why the Dutch have the highest per capita contribution in the world to uh, so we are in solar, and we can correct that, but that's just the way we are, and often we think <clears throat> too narrowly. Now. now the next one is, is legal. I told you I'm a lawyer. We're too legalistic. Uh, we get tied up in, uh, in, uh, in words uh, that we like, and uh, we don't want to change because we're lawyers, and, and that's, uh, that's an important thing. Naive, well, I think that's uh, self-explanatory. Um, friendly, absolutely. We're the most friendly people in the world, which is great. A remarkable characteristic. Uh, we meet people well, and we often, we, more so than we do, we often take the initiative to introduce ourselves to, to strangers, uh, and when you're negotiating with them and trying to, to become a, a friendly with them. Flexible, we usually have uh, more flexibility in instructions than most other governments. And we are risk takers. We're willing to take a risk, and that's very unusual in the negotiating world. Uh, but it's a very positive characteristic of my, my belief. We're pragmatic, we're practical, uh, and we're always prepared. We're the best prepared nation of any in the world with regard to track one or governmental uh, international negotiations. So those are a brief rundown, and then you have a chance to look over what I'm talking about with, um, with the, the people who met with us the last um, this month. Uh, there are nine, there, there are ten countries, counting the United States, with 12 people. And it's remarkable how different each country is. As these are written by the colonels, depending on course, uh, toward the end of the course. This is what they perceive as to be. Now, I have three other stories to tell you. One pause now, or what the show going? I'm ready to continue. Yeah. Uh, maybe if we have a couple of quick questions and then uh, okay. some of the stories. Thomas? I have one question about the uh, students' reflection on their national negotiation styles. Now, these are, for example, the first one, the nationality Romanian neg negotiation style. That's a Romanian self describing a Romanian, right? That's right. Okay. I, I to, they just wrote them down themselves after thinking about it. And they sent them in a few days later, actually, so they had time to think about it. Okay. Because I noticed something very interesting, which was that the Americans, the Macedonian came close and the Swiss came close, but otherwise the Americans were the most negative about their own self image. The others, like the Romanian, there was nothing that they put down that was a negative about themselves. Which I thought was an interesting comment on differences between nationalities. That's right. And you'll see that every one of those people, they have some similarities, but everyone has differences. And this is something that 
that very few people recognize. And I think that that's a critical cross-cultural issue um, when you're dealing with other with other nationalities. Like one American, but ten out of ten things that were negative about Americans. Let me talk about three. Um, Projects. I'm not talking about my answer. Let's. Uh, do you mind passing this? Uh, in 1985, yeah. uh, I wrote the first book on what we call Track to Diplomacy, or Citizen Diplomacy. I expanded that in a chapter in 89 and in 1991, Dr. Louise Diamond and I were what we called multi-track diplomacy, which we call a systems approach to peace. So this idea evolved over a five or six year period. So you see in this chart of a circle and an inner circle. Track one at the top is government. And track one is always under instruction, usually conservative, <coughs> often not very imaginative, uh, and uh, uh, that's what governments around the world, we call them track one. Track two, non-governmental. Everything outside of government is track two. Most of the work that you all are doing will be under the track two label. And track two is innovative. It is risk-taking. Uh, it is not afraid to take on new ideas and new new approaches. It's not under instructions. And it can do things that track one does not want to do or is afraid to do. And then we expanded, that was in the first book, then we expanded to these other tracks. Track three is the role of business. A business can be, as you know, a very powerful change agent or it can also be a very negative change agent. So you have to educate business on how it can get involved in concerning about the conflict itself. Track four are citizen exchange programs. We have several people here from other cultures. They come here, learn some new skills, go back and hopefully practice them uh, in their home country. In this country, the Fulbright program is a great uh, exchange agent. State Department's best program, aside from that, is the International Visitors Program. They bring about 10,000 people from around the world every year to this country for three weeks and they learn new skills and and go back. Uh, next week, for example, I'm meeting with four Israelis uh, brought over by the State Department's program. Two are Jews and two are Arabs. Well, they're all Israeli citizens. And they asked to come and talk to me. So that would be very interesting exchange. Track five is education training. What we do is a, as an institute. Track six is peace activism or people power. Track seven is religion. Track eight is money. Uh, can't raise money for peace in this country or anything. And that inner circle is the most powerful one. It's one that you all are involved with, aside from track three. And then that's communication. And that's communication. The art of communication, uh, not just the media, the TV, and so forth, but talking to people. Uh, I have a very firm statement based on my experience. The only way you can solve a conflict and I underline only, the only way to solve a conflict at any level of society, with your students, with your parents, your kids, all the way up to the nation, is to sit down face to face and talk about it. There are no other ways. You can't do it by email or telephone or whatever. The only way, and that is a tough way. It's a very tough way to do it. It sounds easy, but in many cultures, it's difficult to do. But that's absolutely essential what you do. So communications is the heart of what we're all about. My institute started in 1992. We started at ground zero. We had no money. We had uh, nothing to start with. And gradually, we built up over that. We're now 17 years old. The average life expectancy of an NGO in Washington, D.C. is five years. So we're hanging in there. And so I want to talk about three projects 
under that mandate. I have many others I can talk about, but of these three, I think that you would want to hear about. The first is about divided Cyprus, a beautiful island in the eastern Mediterranean. In 1960, when the British Empire was collapsing, they decided Cyprus was part of their empire, that they would take the uh, the brief government and help them become a nation state. Now, again, for your education, there's only one way you can become a nation state in this world. There's only one way. It's all laid out in the charter, which everybody has signed. 51 nations signed it in 1945, every nation in the world at that time. 192 nations now. All of those new nations have gone through this process. What does that require? A one of the five permanent members of the Security Council, the U.S., Britain, France, China, Russia, has to present your candidacy to the Security Council. All five permanent members have to agree. Then the majority of the Security Council agrees, and then two-thirds of the General Assembly of the United Nations has to agree. That is the only way that you become a nation under international law. And Mr. Bush thinks that because he announced that Kosovo was an independent nation, qualifies, it doesn't. They're not a nation. Putin responded with the Kazi and South Ossetia and Georgia, saying they're an independent nation. They're not. They're totally not. Leadership like that cannot declare a nation. There's only one path that you can go down. And so the British took Cyprus there, and they became a nation. And for four years, they had a nice, uh, peaceful democracy. When Greece got a little greedy and decided to take over the island, there was an attempted coup that failed in 1964. The Security Council met, set up a peacekeeping mission. They went to the island, drew a line down the middle, called the Green Line, and uh, for 10 years there was an uneasy peace with very little interaction. In 1974, another attempted coup. This time, Turkey sent in 35,000 troops, a lot of killing a lot of killing the first time, but much more the second time. And all the Muslims moved to the north, and all the Christians moved to the south. And that island, you couldn't cross the Green Line, you couldn't make a phone call, you couldn't send a letter, totally isolated one side from the other. We were invited, we, all, we, only, go, we only go where we are invited into a situation by the people. We don't get invited by government and we don't respond to government. We're invited by the people, which means that there's a small group in that conflict area who wants some help. And then so we were invited to come to Cyprus, like Cyprus. And uh, we went there and we listened for three weeks. We listened. We got permission from the other side on the UN to go to the other side. We were back and forth. We just listened for three weeks. We asked people what their needs were, something else the governments don't do. Ask people what their needs are. It's so simple, but it doesn't happen. I guarantee you, it just does not happen. Governments will tell you what your needs are and they'll fix them for you. Well, it, it just doesn't work that way. So we told them we had no money, but we had some skills. And if they, we could help them if they wanted it. Both sides decided they wanted skill training and conflict resolution and peace building. And so, when we take on a project, another fundamental, we make a five-year commitment to that project. Five years, not a weekend, not a month, five years or longer if they want. So, we started, and uh, I have lots of stories about that, but I'll, I'll move ahead. Well, I'll tell you this. We then called on four track one entities. So we were invited by all of these tracks except track one. So we called on Mr. Denktosh, who was the prime minister of the Turkish Muslim North. And we called on Mr. Kareez, who was the prime minister of the Greek Christian South. And we called on the State Department. Uh, and we called on the United Nations, New York, and on the ambassador of the UN and the island. We had the same conversation. I said, we have now been invited to this stalemated situation that's been going on since 1964 by people on both sides of the Green Line to 
come and help them start a peace process. We just wanted you to know, we're not asking for a letter or anything like that, we just wanted you to be informed. Well, they didn't quite seem to get that. So I said, I believe that all conflict can be resolved. And to me, there's no such thing as an intractable conflict. I still believe that to this day. And I said, at some point in time, you're going to sign a peace treaty between the North and the South. And I said, Turkish soldiers will go home, the UN peacekeepers will go home, you'll have peace in your beautiful island for three weeks. And then someone who doesn't like peace, and there are lots of those out there, will throw a bomb or commit an act of violence in a village or in a community on the island. At that time, we will have trained a critical mass of Cypriots together. And they'll have connections in that village or that community. And they will go there and they will contain the conflict so it doesn't spread across the island. They will go is to break the cycle of conflict. If you can break the cycle of conflict, you can then build a peace process that will actually last. Well, somehow they seemed to get that. And they nodded and that was that. And so we came back over the years on the island. We worked separately, separately from the Muslims in the north, separately from the Christians in the south, for 15 months. 15 months. Finally, we identified six people from each side who were prepared to sit together on the Green Line who were leaders in their respective communities. We had a political leader from each side. We had a university president. We had a businessman, had a lawyer, a journalist, a poetess, 12 people. By this time, it had our trainings. They trusted us. Key word is trust. They trusted us. They had the skills. And they come an hour after they came together, they bonded and became our steering committee for the next eight years. <clears throat> we were eight years on the island. <clears throat> we trained 2,500 Cypriots together in the UK and the United States on the island. And then we ran out of money and we left. <laughs> Four years ago, under the then Deputy Prime Minister of the Turkish Muslim North raised the gates on the Green Line. He announced to the world he wanted people to move back and forth across the Green Line, get to know where they used to live, their former neighbors, like the all these next day. Within the first 24 hours, 5,000 people crossed the Green Line. Nobody was shot, nobody was hurt, nobody was beaten up. The next three months, 700,000 people crossed the Green Line. There are only a million people on the island. Who was it who changed the whole concept, who changed the system, who changed 40 years of history? One of the six Muslims that we had worked with for two years, who was part of that group of six plus six, ten years later, had the power and the will and the desire to bring people together and raise the kids. My second story is about Kashmir. Kashmir is a province in India, Jammu and Kashmir. In 1947, when Pakistan was created and all the Muslims were supposed to go to Pakistan and all the Hindus to India, every Maharaja had the right to decide where to go. On the root cause of the conflict in Kashmir, is the fact that in the last second of the decision-making process, the Maharaja of Jammu and Kashmir, with 85% of the population was Muslim, went to India. That's the root cause of the conflict. In 1995, when we were only three years old as an institute, I was visited by two three-star generals, one from India, and one from Pakistan. They came to my office and within two minutes, 
they asked me to solve the cashmere problem. I laughed and I said, I can't do that. But they were serious men. They were here at the Stenson Center for a month, uh, heard about my institute, came to see me, very serious. They said, we have fought two wars against each other. We don't want to fight a third war. We think that you as a little NGO may have some influence. Our two governments are doing nothing about this. Nothing. These are two three-star generals both criticizing their respective governments, now private citizens. I said, well, you don't have any money, we don't have any money, but let's see what we can do. Well, two years went by. When I was visited by a man from Bombay, Sandeep Westkalar, who'd done some work in India and Kashmir, and uh, we had a long talk, and he said, you know, I came up with an idea, and I said, how would it be if we tried to work with business leaders in India to get them to think about Kashmir? positive sense. I said, remember in 1988 there were 800,000 tourists in Kashmir. Three months later it was zero because of fear the whole economy collapsed. And I said, if we can help them focus on Kashmir, in the next five years they can rebuild and reinvest and, and uh, have a major, they can make a real difference. I thought that was a great idea and he invited me to Bombay. The very next day, under the International Visitors Program, a distinguished leader from Pakistan was brought to my office. He was a parliamentary leader and he was also a businessman. He had the Pepsi Cola franchise in Lahore, which is now 6 million people. And we had the same conversation and the same invitation. So it was a great idea. A week later, I got a letter from the PhD Chamber of Commerce in Delhi, who heard about our interest in business and peace and asked if we could come to, to Delhi. Well, we've been working with the Dalai Lama, the government of in exile for the last 15, 18 years. In fact, we have a delegation there right now doing our 13th training. And we had some money to do that, and so in, in the 97, we went to uh, Dharamsala, and then we did the Delhi, Bombay, and Lahore, and got some money from the Knight Foundation, that's the Cal Peace Foundation, who would like the idea of business and peace building. And over the next several years, built relationships. We finally did a three-day training at the PhD Chamber for 28 business leaders from Delhi. And two months later, 50 business leaders from Pakistan. Uh, and the Lieutenant General from Pakistan opened the seminar, which was great. So we began to reach out to the business community. Same time, we're reaching out to Kashmiris themselves. I've been in Jammu and Srinagar on the Indian side of Masafabad and the Pakistan side. And over the years, they've done a number of very exciting things. We had four separate trainings, for example, in Washington, D.C., but trained over 65 parliamentary leaders from well, free Kashmir and Zod Kashmir. Uh, you've got to remember that there are no international uh, agencies in either side, and there are no NGOs. It's a, they just keep them out. It's a very sad situation. And we worked as much as we could on the Indian side, which is more restricted. But I was invited to make a speech on April 7, 2000, uh, at a refugee camp outside of Masakrabad. About a thousand refugees had fled from India for fear of their lives and were living in very poor conditions there. And I talked about what we were doing, and then I said, you all remember the, the politicians bus which took place the year before, 1999, where the Prime Minister of India took a bus from Delhi to Lahore and met with the Prime Minister of Pakistan. And they issued the Lahore Declaration about Kashmir, but it fell apart for other reasons a few months later. They all remember the politicians bus. I said, I want to start a people's bus, a people's bus, just for Kashmir. 95% of Kashmir has families on the other side of the line of control, which was set up decades ago. 95% of the line of families. I said, the people with us just for Kashmir, back and forth across the barriers that have been put up in this line of control. They thought it was a great idea. And I came back to Washington, began to push it with both embassies, with the press. Finally got the press really involved, uh, very excited about the idea. 
Uh, and then, of course, the goal was to move it from track two to track one. We had no power to raise any barriers. Uh, heavily fortified mine. Three years went by. And suddenly, out of the blue, the Indian government issued a press release called Track Two Initiative. So they had heard about Track Two, and it was good for my ego to know that the word had spread that far. <laughs> and there were five ideas reducing conflict, and the third one was the People's Bus. They'd taken the exact language, the whole idea, made it theirs, which is perfect, and said, let's have a People's Bus linking the two sides. Four days later, the Pakistan government agreed. I thought, well, we're really set. It's going to happen right now. It didn't. Uh, diplomats got involved in arguing about it, uh, and uh, what kind of documentation is needed, what kind of UN stamps or visas or whatever. And so they were really stuck. Well, in 2004, we finally got some money. And for the first time in history, we brought 10 Pakistanis and 10 uh, Indian Kashmiris together. Not in India, not in Pakistan, but in a neutral third spot, in Kathmandu, Nepal. There were 10 on each side, all private citizens, all uh, track two and all the track, no government. Difficult to pull together, but we were able to do that. And we had a wonderful session in Kathmandu for the first time in history. And I remember one that first evening after we'd worked separately and then brought them together, that one of the men on the, on the there were eight women, by the way, out of the 20, two from Pakistan and six from India. And uh, one of the men on the Pakistan side said, you know, I have a sister who lives in Jammu on the Indian side. I haven't seen her in decades. And I'm very unhappy about this barrier that we can't cross. But one of the women said, well, I live in Jammu. Where does your sister live? And he told her, she said, well, that's only five minutes from my house. You write her a letter and we'll take some pictures together. And when I get back to Jammu, I'll go see your sister, give her the letter, and tell her what a great guy you are. <laughs> wow, his heart melted on the spot. You can see it's people to people, it's all different people. So we had a great time there. Uh, but they were afraid on the Indian side. They were afraid that uh, they would be put in jail or whatever for meeting with those uh, terrible uh, Kashmiris on the other side. And I agree with that. So we were very, didn't tell anybody, we didn't know it happened, no names, not even the fact that we'd done the training, honoring their concern. Well, when I came back, and this was in 2004, and heard that the diplomats were stalemated, I wrote the foreign ministers of each country. And I said, we've just come back from bringing Kashmiris together in Kathmandu, and four of the people from India didn't even have a passport or a visa or anything. They had their ID cards, which had been given out in election earlier in that year, signed by the mayor that they're Kashmiris. That's all they needed to get to the bottom. Why did she use that same idea on the people's vote? Because the Pakistanis had no problems, all Indian problems. Well, I got my wrist slapped. You know. But they did get a response. But in December of 2004, people got fed up. The president of Pakistan and the prime minister of India ordered the foreign ministers to approve the people's budget. And so on February 15, 2005, they announced the first bus would be April 7, 2005, five years to the day after I had proposed the idea. That was pretty exciting. And it changed the whole subcontinent. <coughs> Mrs. Gandhi, head of the Communist Party, Prime Minister of uh, India, flew up to Srinagar as great goodbye to the bus on the Indian side. Prime Minister of Azad Kashmir met the Indian bus. And on April the 8th, 2005, on the front page of the Washington Post, the Wall Street Journal, the New York Times, is this beautiful picture of this big, of 20 Pakistanis crossing over, first time in history, to the Indian side. Well, that changed a lot. Actually, that October 2005 was a great earthquake in Kashmir. And because of these connections, they finally opened five crossing points 
for India to bring in supplies to help Kashmir. We had a second training in 2006 in the Maldive Islands because there was trouble in Sri Lanka and in, in Nepal. And we had 27 people together. Uh, most of, of the first group returned. We had 14 from Pakistan, 13 from, from India. We had a great, uh, great uh, time together. But this time the atmosphere was quite different from the Indian side. We had two journalists, one from Pakistan and one from India, and they were very excited by the end of our time together. They wanted to issue a press release. So they sat down, they wrote a press release, and they negotiated with the whole group, and it was approved. And when they got back, it was repeated all over the subcontinent and all languages. The first time in history, Kashmiris had met together successfully to talk about uh, and work together about their future. We're still deeply involved. 2007, I was invited to uh, Islamabad to um, participate in a little group of 35 people on the future of Kashmir. Uh, Dr. Boris, our chief of training, and I went there together. And we were taken to this enormous conference center to do our little group thing with 35 people. When we arrived, we were taken into this conference hall with 1,500 people. There. The conference was opened by the Prime Minister of Pakistan. Track one had moved in, mm -hmm. taken over. Unfortunately, they left on lunch at lunchtime, and we were left alone for the next three days. And suddenly I was made chairman of the group. And so that put me in a slightly different role. So at the end of that three days, the 1,500 were reconvened. And I had to report back to the 1500. And the most important recommendation I made, I said my institute was going to convene and facilitate a meeting of Kashmiris from both sides of the line of control to come together with the idea of designing together their own future. I said neither government has taken any action along this line since 1947. And what we want to see it's a peace conference, and we want three delegations at the conference table. We want a Pakistan delegation, an Indian delegation, and a joint Kashmir delegation. That's that out. And we're still working on it. We're still trying to raise money for it. <laughs> but that's one of the things that we are trying to do. My last story uh, has to do with Punjab in India. Last uh, June 20, I was in Amritsar. Amritsar is the capital of the world Sikh religion. There are 36 million Sikhs in the world, 500,000 in the United States, 400,000 in Canada. And because of our work with Kashmir, a year earlier I had been approached by Sikh Trivedas Singh who had gotten his master's degree at American University in conflict resolution and had heard about the people's bus. And his goal was to link Punjab, which is a divided province, in half in Pakistan and half in India. Amritsar um, and Pakistan and India and Lahore in Pakistan. And he'd written a book about Punjab, Punjab relations, asked for our help, and we've been working together. So when he heard that we were going to Dharamsala uh, and we were going to go through Amritsar, he said, let me arrange a whole day meeting for you. He was then in Delhi, so he came over, and then we had a, a whole day together. He did a great job. And in the morning, we met with the vice chancellor of the university and 20 members of his faculty to talk about what we're doing. The vice chancellor is responsible for 150,000 students. Put that in perspective, <laughs> working your work, 150,000 students. And then at 2 o'clock in the afternoon, my first ever meeting uh, with a Sikh from Amritsar, a very distinguished uh, gentleman, Pundit uh, uh, Singh Wadala. He had a long white beard, and he, over a cup of tea, told me about what his was trying to do. He said, for seven years, 
I tried to get the Indian government to listen to me. I've never had a single word of reply in any of the things that I have done. I said, well, what, is, what is your dream? What's your project? He said, when the founder of the Sikh religion died 500 years ago, he was cremated and his ashes are buried when they put into two shrines that are now today in Pakistan, four kilometers from the Indian border. And a third shrine ashes were put in India, one kilometer from the border. He said, my dream is to have those three shrines connected so we can move back and forth peacefully which we have not been able to do since 1947. And it's like the Muslims going to Mecca. Every Sikh, I learned later, prays every day to make that journey. So this is a pretty powerful dream for him. And so I said, well, let's go take a look at the border. Now, some of you have an MBA. You know what an MBA is. I bet you don't know what an MBWA is. MBWA is managed by walking around. <laughs> Write it down and do it. Nobody does it, especially MBAs. <laughs> They're all on the computer. Management by walking around. It's so easy to do, and nobody does it. So I said, I want to go see what this border's like. Well, he had arranged, now telling me this, for a press conference take place on the board. And so we got there, and there were 15 members of the press, national television, radio, and, and print. And so I was about to make a speech, and when word came out from the military leader there, no press conference is allowed here. Well, they were devastated, and I was wondering what to do. They were milling around, and so forth. I finally had an idea, and I said, uh, gentlemen, they were all men, I want to make a speech on the great Indian Constitution and all those wonderful paragraphs talking about freedom of the press, freedom of religion, freedom of assembly, <laughs> all those good things. The guy on national television was recording and all. <laughs> One minute later, the captain changed his mind. <laughs> He said, we can have a press conference. <laughs> <laughs> he can see himself on national television denying the Constitution. <laughs> so I made a real speech. And I pointed over my left shoulder. And I pointed to a 75-foot watchtower. And I saw on national television a soldier climbing up with a machine gun to sit on that tower, overlooking the empty plain of Pakistan where you could see the two shrines with the naked eye. And down here below us was a barbed wire entanglement, which they electrified at night with enough power to kill anybody that touched it. Mm -hmm. I said, this reminds me of North Korea and South Korea and those towers on the, war on the, on the border. It reminds me of East Germany and West Germany and Berlin Wall and towers separating East Germany and West Germany. He said, I didn't know that India and Pakistan were at war with each other. I said, what we need is a peace zone, a peace corridor, linking the three shrines, only five kilometers long, so that the people can move back and forth freely, without obstruction, without stopping by you know, all these security things. And I said, that is the dream of many Sikhs, and that's what I would like to see happen, and I would like to see if we can do it. Then, we visited the shrine on the Indian side, and that evening, I was hosted for dinner by five business leaders, all Sikhs from Amritsar, and I told them what I had just done, and they were very excited about the business opportunity. I said, I want you to plan to build stores on each side of the corridor. There'd be tens of thousands of people moving back and forth. This would be great for your business and for the whole community. They thought that was a wonderful idea. So we went to Dharamsala, did the training, came back to Washington, and I said, has anything happened as a result of this uh, press conference? They said, well, yes, actually, on June 28th, eight days later, the 
foreign minister of India, a foreign minister, flew down to Amritsa, went over to the same place where you had been standing, and he made a big speech and said the Indian government will carry out a feasibility study for the peace zone. Wow. In my whole career, that's the fastest we've ever had an idea move from track to So I turned to him in front of the audience of 70 people and I said, sir, you have to open your mind. You have to have a vision for the future. I said, my vision, we do the feasibility study, we get the governments to agree to it, we get it built one way or the other, and within the next five or ten years, there will be a, a village around this car. There will be a university located, there will be research institutes. In 20 years, there will be a town, a city. This is my vision for the future. You should share that vision and support this project. Well, I got a big round of applause at that point. And within the next 15 minutes, it was just euphoria. 15 minutes later, the leader of the group said, we have now got $60,000 in pledges. I've never happened to that way before in my life. <laughs> and they realized that this was going to happen suddenly. And so every one of those 70 Sikhs wanted a picture with me. <laughs> <laughs> we took half an hour to take a picture. And uh, we now signed a memorandum of understanding and set up a structure with five Sikhs. I'm the chairman, all part of our institute. We have a Sikh from New York, we have a Sikh from California who invited us, we have three Sikhs from the region here, and they will help to guide us, and uh, we're on our way. So, those are my stories. Thank you for listening. <laughs> say is we make the impossible possible. It can be done. And that's the lesson I want you to take with you. Your dream can take place. It can be fulfilled. You can make the impossible possible. Hope is critical. The heart is essential. In everything we do, we touch the heart. If you touch the heart, then you can bring about change. That's the thing to remember. It's about the heart. So, questions? I'm in your hands. You want to feel the question? I'm just letting that statement sink in for a second. <laughs> <laughs> sure, let's carve a little bit more time out of Q&A. And, and Paul's hand was up in the first round, so let's go back there. Yeah, I'm just uh, curious, in your um, earlier, the sheet that you handed out, in terms of what makes a good negotiator, and there's a uh, point seven here was honesty. and. and you hadn't mentioned it, and I'm just curious. In terms of very good point. <laughs> in, in terms of negotiation, uh, that was an oversight not to mention. It. I, I get it, but I'm just curious in terms of um, to what extent are you upfront with all the information when you're negotiating with the no, opposite no, side? I didn't say that. No, I know. Well, Honesty, and, very. Yeah, yeah. Let me, let me yeah. comment on that because I love your question. Thank you for bringing it up. I can tell you, as a diplomat. And since that time, I have not knowingly ever told a lie. Now think about that. That's not the way diplomats are perceived. I've never knowingly told a lie. Honesty is the best policy. Very simple reason for that. If you are dishonest and you're caught in a lie, and you will be caught at one time or another, your trust relationship evaporates, disappears. You cannot function if you're dishonest. Now, I don't put all my cards on the table, I, I don't open up all the time, but I also don't have to say anything. Now this is something very few people realize. You don't have to answer. You just say, oh, I, I can't answer that question. There's nothing wrong with that. Because if you answer that question, it might lead into a lie. So just say, well, no, that whatever it doesn't relate, or I'm sorry, I can't do that. But when you speak, you speak the truth. That's a powerful lesson. I'm sorry I overlooked that. Oh, you. You're absolutely on target. But you don't I say you, you don't put out all of your cards on the table. That's silly. But you don't tell a lie because it's essential to keep a trust relationship going if you're ever going to conclude some kind of an agreement down the line. It doesn't have to happen also 
overnight. You can say, well, this is tomorrow or the next week or whatever. You don't have to go in. Now, this is difficult for politicians because they all like a quick fix. You know, this is our impatience. Probably. They want to do it on their time frame, on their watch. Well, that isn't the way the world works. This is why I say that timing and patience are so critical. But always remember that honesty is the best policy. Thank you for that. Um, there, there was a comment you made, uh, and I appreciate your, your presentation, the stories that you shared. Uh, just a little preface of a story uh, that I experienced when I traveled to Egypt many years ago. I had a roommate who was Haitian, and he wrote this note. We were talking about politics and all this. He wrote this note, and I think he was quoting Alexander the Great. If you want peace, get ready for war. And you made a comment that was very interesting. You said nobody wants to fund peace initiatives, but we all know that it's very easy to fund wars or find money for wars. Why do you think that, that we have that irony that nobody wants to focus on peace, but there's this whole build up of war, buying missiles and uh, spending all this money? <coughs> Let me tell you a story first about Alexander the Great. <laughs> um, I was posted in Turkey around Pakistan from 1959 to 1963. And I was sent out there by Secretary Dulles. And I was told to finish a railroad that uh, had been pledged to many years ago. What happened in 1935 was that the Reza Shah of Iran and Ataturk of Turkey, the two feminine fathers of modern Iran and modern Turkey, signed a treaty to build a railroad linking their two capitals, 1,500 miles apart, Ankara and Tehran. And so they started, and World War II came along, they stopped, the war ended, and they started up again, and, and then they ran out of money, and there was a 350-mile section over a very difficult mountain in Lake terrain, and they just stopped. And so, the Central Treaty Organization, which still was the Korea, the old Baghdad Pact, the Secretary was based in Ankara, and was supposed to finish the railroad. So I did a survey on horseback with engineers and so forth about the path of the railroad through the mountains. And we came across a tomb of one of Alexander the Great's generals, who passed through there in 331 BC and had died and was buried there. And his troops went on to Tehran, and they went on to Damascus, and they conquered the Iranian Empire. Well, when we got to Tehran after that journey, I held a press conference to talk about the railroad and all the good things that would happen economically once the railroad was completed. And at the end, I sort of mentioned this tomb and the fact that I was delighted to find this tomb of one of Alexander the Great's generals. The headlines in the Tehran press the next day were American imperialists, that was me, <laughs> American imperialists reminds us of our defeat at the hands of Alexander the Great in 331 BC. No Iranian has ever forgotten that date. So you should know that there's always a history and you should learn the history. 331 BC, and those headlines that I reminded them of their defeat. So Alexander the Great had to trigger that story. On the larger issue, I have no answer. <laughs> I wish I knew how to raise money for peace. And a lot of people keep trying, uh, and we try every day. But um, I, one little example, in all of Washington, D.C., which is filled with monuments, there's only one monument to a peace building in the whole city. That's in front of the Indian Embassy, and it's a statue of Gandhi. It's the only peaceful statue in Washington, D.C. We always talk about war. We don't talk about peace. It's part of our culture. Thank you. If you have any guidance for me on that, let me know. Please. Yes. Um, Pastor McDonald, first of all, it's a, a pleasure and a blessing to be in your presence today um, and to hear all of your insights. Um, it's just invaluable. It's priceless. And um, as a female uh, aspiring to do 
some of the wonderful types of work that you've done, what would you say in all of your observations are some of the considerations that females need to make in going out into the world and trying to forge agreements and create peace? Well, first of all, as I said earlier, you have to realize, in spite of the men, that you're the peace builders. That's fundamental. Women are the peace builders because they're the ones who are affected first in war. They're the ones that get raped. They're the ones that get killed. Their kids get beaten up, whatever. They're, they're hungry. The men go off to war, and they're left behind to survive. So they know about war sometimes much more brutally than men do. And so they are the ones who really want peace more than anybody else. And so you build on that. Now, when you travel the world, you'll find there are enormous cultural differences between men and women. And we'll go into that because all of you know that. But what you try to do is work with the women who already have the insight to do something. And there is a book that you should look up that was done by Dr. Noah Zanoli, a friend of mine who we worked together on my, on my book. She worked for me for three years at the Iowa Peace Institute. She's from Switzerland. She's a great lady. She has her PhD. And um, she now lives in Bern, Switzerland. And they put together, with the help of the Swiss government, a book called A Thousand Women for Peace. A Thousand Women for Peace and it was submitted for the Nobel Peace Prize in 2005 by the Swiss government. They didn't get it, but they now put together a book which you can buy on Amazon.com, a thousand pages long. And on each page is a picture of a woman and her biography on the other page from 135 countries around the world. And so you want to buy that book, and when you go overseas, look and see if they're in the book and then you can begin to relate to them because they're already there and they are the peace builders in their particular country. And now the Swiss government is sponsoring uh, a later study and research, 10,000 women for peace. So it's out there. You can buy it on Amazon.com and I think that will give you some guidance about when you go overseas, who you can relate to, who you can talk to, who's already there and how it can help build on, on that process. I'm being visited uh, next Tuesday uh, by four women from Rostov on the Don. Uh, they were originally were brought to meet with me a couple of years ago. Uh, they're from Russia, of course. They're in the North Caucasus. And um, uh, we got to know each other one afternoon, and I brought out the book. And I showed it to them, and they went right and found the founder of their NGO is in the book. And that, of course, made our relationship a very powerful one because they had not heard about the book and not realized it when it was published. And we've been working with them now. It's very difficult to work in Russia today because Putin has kicked out all international NGOs. There are no international NGOs in Russia. He's through a re-registration process. And he's making it very difficult for local NGOs to work and get any money from outside. So what we have now done, started with the World Bank, we've gotten the World Bank with Japanese money to transfer $2 million to UNICEF, which is still allowed to be there as a UN agency, in Moscow, and they sent it down to Rostov. And we're trying to help the women of the Don access that money with us with working on peer mediation training the teachers and training the kids out of self comfort, which we've done for many years in various places around the world. And they're coming here to talk about that project. But uh, that, re that, that sort of triggered what, uh, what I think you should do as an next step. I see no other hands up. I think let's say thanks again.